Good evening. Hi, I'm Sabrina Starneman. I'm the acting director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology. Um, it's great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, this is our fourth event in the series, uh, The Power of Science Fiction. Um, and tonight, uh, I am so happy that we have Nadia Korfor. Uh, she is co-sponsored uh, by the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology and by the School of Arts and Humanities Graduate Student Association. Tonight kicks off their graduate uh, conference, academic conference uh, called RAW, which will be going on all weekend. And there's people from all over here who are getting ready to present um, in the next couple of days. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Nettie Corfor is an author of speculative fiction, but I guess you probably know that if you're already here, right? Everybody is a fan. Um, she is a full professor of creative writing and literature at the University of Buffalo in New York, which is part of the SUNY system. Uh, her, her work has been published in all manner of uh, journals and anthologies, including Dark Matter, Reading the Bones, which won the World Fantasy Award for Best Anthology in 2005. She's actually been a very busy woman for the last 15 years, it seems. Um, and uh, she has been, won many, many awards. Most recently, Who Fears Death uh, won the World Fantasy Award for the Best Novel in 2011 and was a James Triptree honor book. Uh, and then this past year, uh, her novella, Binti, won uh, both the, no uh, the Nebula and the Hugo uh, for best novella. Uh, we will have an opportunity at, after um, Dr. Okorafor speaks to do Q&A, and then we will also have a chance for you guys to get your book signed or get some books if you would like. So without further ado, let us welcome Nettie Okorafor. Okay, which one? Ah, okay, there we go. Good evening. That's better. So I'm gonna just jump right into it. So, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the Christ Hospital. My mom told me this. The same hospital at which both of my sisters were born, the same hospital at which my father was doing his residency in general surgery, my mother, my mother earned her bachelor's at the University of Cincinnati and then her master's in hospital administration at Xavier University. She started that master's degree four months after I was born. However, I never knew this city of my birth because we moved a year after I was born. When someone mentions Cincinnati, I don't think of home. In a lot of ways, the disconnection from my place of birth goes right along with the narrative of who I am. I'm the child of Nigerian immigrants. My parents came, for, came to the United States in 1969 to attend school. They planned to return to Nigeria to their home and family with their degrees and knowledge that they earned. However, the Biafran War broke out around that time and they weren't able to go back. When the war was over, and so they, stayed, and so they stayed here and became Americans. When the war was over, they reconnected with family and started taking my siblings and me to Nigeria to get to know our heritage and relatives. At the same time, here in the United States, after leaving Cincinnati, Ohio, staying a few years in Indianapolis, Indiana, we settled into South Holland, Illinois a growing town in the southern suburbs of Chicago, where my father began his career as a cardiovascular surgeon. This would be the town I'd identify as one of my homes because we, because we lived here until I was about 12 years old. We were one of the first black families to move here. Not only was this neighborhood not used to diversity, it was hostile towards it. My parents were immigrants, knowledgeable about race to some extent in the United States, but not that knowledgeable. Where they saw a nice, quaint, family-friendly neighborhood, African-Americans would have seen the red flags. 
To make a long story short, being a little black girl in South Holland, Illinois in the 80s was to live through the aftershocks of the 60s. In our neighborhood, our home, my sisters and I were lucky we could run really fast. So having the black, so having the black American experience of South Holland, Illinois, coupled with brief, very frequent trips to Nigeria had a very profound effect on me and my siblings. My worldview was broad. I questioned, I noticed. I knew that other places existed outside of, racist south, outside of the racist south suburbs of Chicago. Very early in life, I understood what diversity was and why it was important. I saw firsthand what could happen when a place lacked it. I call myself Niger-American. Niger is Nigerian slang for Nigerian. Niger-American is one word, implying that to be Nigerian and American cannot be separated from one or another. And the word itself is completely different, a completely different word from American and Nigerian. It's something new. And in many ways, I believe that this is why I wound up writing science fiction. Science fiction is the genre of invention. The concept of the computer I used to type these words was first dreamed up in a science fiction novel. The same is true for the internet, cell phones, submarines, e-readers, satellites, robots, and much more. Most modern technology was born within science fiction first. Science fiction is also the genre of speculation, the what if, and it's obsessed with travel, space travel, aliens, adapting, colonizing, interacting, reacting to other planets and people, exploration, the future. However, when it comes to Western-rooted science fiction, what most, what most would consider classic science fiction, xenophobia, fear of the other, the alien, the, co the coveting of home and the need to protect it, to keep it pure, is reflective of real world, belie of real world beliefs. This isn't the case for the science fiction I write, however. There's a reason for that, which I'll get to. So I travel a lot. No one ever told me this, but despite the fact that writing is such a solitary practice, getting published can take you all around the world. So, about three years ago, I got really sick of the TSA. <laughs> it was my hair. Every time I traveled, it earned me a full pat down, especially of my hair. I tried going through security with it up, in a large braid on the side, in a ponytail, with it down. It all came to the same treatment. Your hair is setting off all kinds of alarms. <laughs> we need to pat you down. Would you prefer to have it done in a private room? Then they would squeeze, fumble with, inspect my thick hair. Because apparently it's possible to hide knives, a dirty bomb, and a bazooka in here. <laughs> Eventually, of course, I applied for TSA PreCheck to put an end to all of that. The application process required an intense background check. So the exchange was a lot of my privacy. So while in a rather rebellious, cheeky mood, I also wrote this mini comic called LaGuardia. <laughs> it's based on New York's LaGuardia International Airport. It was set at the it was set at the LaGuardia Airport of the future, however. This was one of the beginnings, I believe, one of the beginnings of parts of, one of the beginning parts, one of the many beginnings <laughs> of my Binti novella. God, it took too much to get that out. Jesus. But I didn't know it back then. So at this LaGuardia Airport of the future, there were all kinds of people traveling. All kinds. People with a capital P. 
<laughs> so in this airport of the future, citizens of the world and visitors from all over the galaxy are welcome. This is the future, it's not the present. So in this airport, a woman who is pregnant and happens to be Egyptian-American is coming from Nigeria. <laughs> She's asked to step aside so she can get a full pat down. So she's patted down. It's rather invasive, as you can see. Then she's interrogated. Since the type of human she is, since, since the type of human she is is already clearly an issue, the first thing she's asked is where she's coming from. After she says she's Egyptian American, the TSA officer remarks, you're the blackest Egyptian I've ever seen. Her response is just, what? <laughs> A lot of subtext behind that remark. Then she's asked if she's interacted with any aliens while in Nigeria. That's more subtext. <laughs> and lastly, the officer asks her who the father of her child is and if her child is even human. Subtext. They eventually let her go, and she walks away, clearly pissed. She gets happily into her car and brings something out of her purse. She places it on the dashboard and starts the car, and the plant begins to awaken and grow That's because the plant is not really a plant. The plant is an alien refugee. Welcome to America. <laughs> so yeah, the TSA, the TSA was, was so concerned with their hair, her ethnic background, and where she'd been that they missed the fact that the plant wasn't really a plant at all. As I said, I wrote this when I was in quite a mood. <laughs> oh, the things that inspire. There are plenty. So um, just, to, just to tell you a little bit about this, this comic, that wasn't all of it. Those were just like key parts of it to show the narrative. I teamed up with some luminaries to create that short comic. It was illustrated by Sophie Campbell, a transgender illustrator who's also the author of, um, of Shadow Eyes, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, the Wet Moon series, and Jem, and many other, many other amazing works. He's one of my favorite illustrators and a good friend of mine. And the colors for the, the, the colored portions were done by um, John Jennings, who is an African-American illustrator whose most recent work was the graphic novelization of Octavia Butler's Kindred, which just hit the New York Times bestseller list, yay. If you haven't read it, you really should. Don't think you've read Kindred. If you've read Kindred, then it will be the same experience reading that graphic novel, because it's, it's just, it's a lot more. So aside from issues of immigration and American-flavored xenophobia, one of the other themes I was thinking about when we, when we, is what we allow and give up in order to travel to, in order to travel, to move around, and to leave home and return and how this often depends on who you are. I think today these issues are more timely than ever. In 2015, I wrote my first narrative that took place in space, a, no a little novella called Binti. So after, several, after writing several books and stories, um, I finally decided to leave Earth. I wrote it as a novella partially because I feel like it's the best, I feel like the best way to um, do, the best way to do new things is to take baby steps. I've always been afraid of outer space, absolutely terrified of it. 
It's dark, it's cold, and basically all you're supposed to do as a creature from the earth is die out there. So I'm, I see myself as an earthling through and through, and this is my home. So cl classic themes and narratives of space travel include exploration, colonialization, adventure. However, when I wrote Binti, something else happened. I found myself focusing more on culture, identity, travel, and oddly enough, the theme of home. I think this has a lot to do with how I came to write science fiction. My path to it was not the usual one. I didn't grow up reading science fiction, and I think that this needs to be highlighted and, under, and thoroughly understood. Too often it's assumed that science fiction narratives come from the same ancestral line, reading Verne's, Shelley, Osmov, Heinlein, etc. This was not the case with me, and I think it's not the case with several writers. I didn't grow up reading, I didn't grow up reading science fiction at all, despite the fact that I read a lot. If the story, typically, if the story was good, it didn't matter the genre or the category. I was open to it. However, when I picked up science fiction novels, I'd try to read them, but the worlds they rendered, they were like, they were like being thrust into space with no suit. I didn't live in these books. I couldn't exist in these books. There was no reflection of anyone like myself in these books. I'd identify with the aliens, but the aliens were usually bad. <laughs> I wasn't introduced to Isaac Asimov through his science fiction, even. I was reading his science books, and so that's how I knew that name. Science fiction was inaccessible to me. I started writing science fiction because of my trips to Nigeria, and this was long after I had started writing. For several years, I wrote mainly um, magical realism and, and fantastical uh, stories with fantastical elements. But whenever we'd go to Nigeria, we'd spend half of our time in the city of Lagos, which was, which was modern, fast-paced, and a lot of other things, but modern, fast-paced, um, very hectic. People dressed in both traditional and Western clothes. Um, it was full of new and old ideas all at the same time. And there was electricity sometimes. <laughs> Then we'd spend the other half of these trips in my, in my parents' ancestral villages. Now, the, the, uh, my parents' ancestral villages were far more rural. We, have two, we, ha we own two houses in my father's village in the southeast. It's a huge, beautiful mansion with no running water because the area is so rural and doesn't have that infrastructure. For electricity, we'd use a generator, and most people in that area would use a generator, and I remember people who lived there could only get two channels, BET and MTV. <laughs> that was it. So you can imagine their view of Americans because of this. <laughs> Very limited to international entertainment. Um, I had people ask me some very interesting things. Uh, one was like, one guy came up to me and he said, so do American women really run around in their panties all the time? <laughs> like literally, that's what he asked me. I was like, no. <laughs> so just being from, just, so just from going from, the mod from a very modern part of the country to a rural one. This already had my wheels turning as a writer. It was just, it was, um, you just kind of get this idea of people living in different ways and, and dealing with things in different ways. And it's just very inspiring. It's very inspiring. But it was seeing the way that technology existed and was used both in Lagos and in, the, in southeastern um, villages that made me start thinking about writing science fiction. And the, the one example that I, always, that I always give, because I think it, it, it illuminates this idea very well, is that whenever you're in the village, um, because you didn't have running water, usually a group of girls, especially girls, would um, 
would go to the local stream and collect water in these large containers and carry them on their heads and bring them back to the bring them back to the house. And so that's a very, you know, that's a very traditional African image. But when they would bring these, these containers back to their houses, especially as I got older, I would notice them holding their cell phones away so that they, the, the phone wouldn't get splashed with water. You know, so, so, so there would be that. So that's like one, one, one example. Another example was seeing the market women how the market women use cell phones to bolster their business. So they'd have like groups that they would text and tell them what they have and then, and then they'd go back and forth. So there's that. So I'm seeing the cell phone being used in traditional, um, traditional African markets. So there's that. And then um, people conducting, oh yeah. <laughs> people conducting ex extensive embroiled passionate prayer sessions on their phones <laughs> with relatives far away. It was something, yeah, hours long, like shouting into the phone, like, is this working? Okay. <laughs> I was fascinated by that. Um, the proliferation of portable and chargeable tech also because of the, because of the lack of infrastructure or faulty infrastructure um, was something that I, that I also noticed. Laptops were big in Nigeria far before they were big here. In this country for a long time, desktop computers were the thing. And um, in, in Nigeria, the laptop became important f much earlier because you can charge a laptop and you don't have to rely on the, the power that keeps going on and off and on and off, which can destroy a desktop computer. So, so that was a really um, big, inspiring thing for me. So too, and also, too many times, Africa as a whole, and we know that Africa is not a country, it is a continent, a big, really big continent that's very diverse. I mean, like even just in the country of Nigeria, you can just go a few miles down the road and they will be speaking another dialect, which sounds like a different language, okay? So, so it's just, it's extremely diverse. So we already know that. So when I say Africa, I just know I'm coming from that point of view. So too many times Africa as a whole is portrayed as a place of the past, especially in science fiction, if it's even mentioned at all. And that was a problem, that was a problem for me. Um, uh, one, uh, this is sort of an example, but this is also something I always noticed that, that also kind of inspired me to start writing, in particular, dystopian or post-apocalyptic science fiction set in Africa. It was because, one, I loved, uh, I loved dystopian fiction. I love seeing the world destroyed. <laughs> There's just something cathartic about it. So I've always been reading that. And it's, it's not really a new form of fiction, by the way. That we've got post-apocalyptic fiction that goes way back, way, way, way back. Um, but whenever, especially where the world is being destroyed in some way, um, in those kind of narratives, I would all, there's, there's always, nine times out of 10, there is a, a scene where they do like a pan shot around the world of the whole world freaking out, right? So you've got, you know, you've got, oh, in Japan, they're going, ah, and then in England, they're going, ah, you know, everyone's freaking out. And so I would always wait for that, I'd wait, because that part would be most telling of the, of just how wide the perspective of the film or the, or the, or the book would be. And nine times out of 10, I would wait for Africa, some part of Africa to show up, and it wouldn't be there. And that, I found that very frustrating. It was just, it was either invisible or, um, like I think it was in the, in the film 2012 or The Day After Tomorrow, where <laughs> the film ended with this big arc full of the survivors after the, the world has destroyed itself for whatever reason, full of survivors, and it's going, big arc, mind you and it's going towards Africa. Now, does anyone notice any subtext with that? Okay, <laughs> is anyone? I was infuriated by that. I was actually really shocked that the film would be that ignorant. Um, yeah, so, so I would see things like this and I needed, to see, I needed to see it done right. So I wanted to see the Africa that I was familiar with, which was innovative, not a place of the past, but very much in the present and looking to the future. I wanted to see that. And I wanted to see Africa in the future. And as my mom always says, the best way to get something done is to do it yourself. 
So I started writing. So that was my, um, that was my reason to start writing science fiction. That's how I started, because I, I wanted to see these things and they were not, they were not being shown at all, um, especially from the perspective that I was most interested in and that I was familiar with and that made any kind of sense to me. Also, um, point of view was important as well. I wanted, to see, I wanted to see science fiction from the perspective of people who were in Africa for once, as opposed to an outsider coming in and, and observing things. So back to the idea of home and identity. In the Binti series, I was concerned with the question, can you ever go home once you leave it? I was looking at culture and the future. I'm gonna read a little bit of the beginning here. And might as well look at Himba Woman while I'm reading it. I powered up the transporter and said a silent prayer. I had no idea what I was gonna do if it didn't work. My transporter was cheap, so even a droplet of moisture, or more likely a grain of sand, would cause it to short. It was faulty and most of the time I had to restart it over and over before it worked. Please not now, please not now, I thought. The transporter shivered in the sand and I held my breath. Tiny, flat, and black as a prayer stone, it buzzed softly and then slowly rose from the sand. Finally, it produced the baggage lifting force. I grinned. Now I could make it to the shuttle. I swiped Ojitsé from my forehead with my index finger and knelt down. Then I touched the finger to the sand, grounding the sweet-smelling red clay into it. Thank you, I whispered. It was a half-mile walk along the dark desert road. With the transporter working, I would make it there on time. I straightened up. I paused and shut my eyes. Now the weight of my entire life was pressing on my shoulders. I was defying the most traditional part of myself for the first time in my entire life. I was leaving in the dead of night and they had no clue. My nine siblings, all older than me except for my younger sister and brother, would never see this coming. My parents would never imagine I'd do such a thing in a million years. By the time they all realized what I had done and where I was going, I'd have left the planet. In my absence, my parents would growl to each other that I would never set foot in their home again. My four aunties and two uncles who lived down the road would shout and gossip amongst themselves about how I'd scandalized our entire bloodline. I was going to be a pariah. Go, I softly whispered to the transporter, stamping my foot. The thin metal rings I wore around each ankle jingled noisily, but I stamped my foot again. Once on, the transporter worked best when I didn't touch it. Go, I said again, sweat forming on my brow. When nothing moved, I chanced giving the two large suitcases sitting atop the force field a shove. They moved smoothly, and I breathed another sigh of relief. At least some luck was on my side. So that's the beginning of Binti. Binti is a mathematical genius. She is Himba, which this is a traditional now picture of a Himba woman. And she's been accepted into the finest university in the galaxy, and she's decided to go. Her people are the makers of the astrolabe. This is, the, this is an original astrolabe, and um, this, is a, yeah, this is an Islamic astrolabe, and the this one was perfected by, um, oh, I don't know, I messed this name up. It was perfected by Miriam al Astrolabia Ijlia. And this is a picture of my daughter, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and she is standing with a woman who is dressed as Miriam. And um, this was in the United Arab Emirates, which was where I first learned of the astrolabe. And that astrolabe was really heavy. It's, it's a really amazing piece of technology. That's, once I held that, I knew I wanted to write about it. So in this story, in Binti, astrolabes have evolved into something, something extremely sophisticated that can do more than smartphones. And Binti's insular but brilliant, brilliant people specialize in making them. Great. 
I might make this point elsewhere, but I want to make it now. Um, one more thing about the astrolabe. You can look at this while I say it. The astrolabe basically is an ancient GPS. It tells you where to go. It, it, it tells you, you will know, you will, once you learn how to use it, and it's not easy to learn how to use it, as you can see, because it looks very complex, but um, once you figure out how to use it, it's, it's basically like a GPS. And so that plays, that also plays deeply into the theme of travel that Binti, um, Binti is based on. Okay. So when Binti travels, there's a moment where she must give up her astrolabe and have it scanned. I'm going to read that. The travel security officer scanned my astrolabe, a full deep scan. Dizzy with shock, I shut my eyes and breathed through my mouth to steady myself. Just to leave the planet, I had to give them access to my entire life, me, my family, and all forecasts of my future. I stood there frozen, hearing my mother's voice in my head. There is a reason why our people do not go to that university. Umza Uni wants you, to, wants you for its own gain, Binti. You go to that school and you become its slave. I couldn't help but contemplate the possibility of truth in her words. I hadn't even gotten there yet and already I'd given them my life. I wanted to ask the officer if he did this to everyone, but I was afraid now that he'd done it. They could do anything to me at this point. Best not to make trouble. So Binti must give something up, her information, in order to travel. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. In part two, Binti comes home and must deal with the fact that home may be, oh, this is an interesting sentence. I'm going to read it. Gonna get it done. Okay. In part two, Binti comes home and must deal with the fact that home may be home, but she's no longer so at home at home. <laughs> That's just something I do when I'm writing, and it's just, when I write it into a speech, it's just, wow. Oh. So science fiction, so in conclusion, science fiction has long been a bridge between the sciences and the arts, one that continues to evolve and reflect the effects of technology, science, and socio-political changes on people in their globalized cultures. It's also a way for some of us who live on borders and fringes to explore identity and the fluidity of culture and movement and speculate about their significance and effect on humanity in the future. And I definitely consider science fiction one of my homes. Thank you. Oh, whoa, okay. Um, here, Brian. And uh, so we have a, a time for questions and answers. And if you raise your hand, he'll bring you the microphone. All right, Jess has a question back there. Yeah, then you in a second. There's a lot of students out here who have a midterm essay on Binti, and it's due on Monday. <laughs> so I do not have a midterm okay. essay due on Binti. Tuesday. Oh yes, I'm sorry. It's due on Tuesday. Yes. So this isn't so much of a question as more of a. You kind of answered my question during the uh, during the lecture, and I just wanted to give my appreciation for that. So I was going to ask you. Um, we had the opportunity to read The Lost Diary of Tree Fox Seven the other day in class, which I loved. Um, and I was going to ask you if you thought of it more of a work of uh, magical realism or sort of a, with maybe more of a Lovecraftian theme. But I think that you sort of answered the question that it's, it's more of a transcendent genre moving on to this sort of new, uh, new science fiction, new something that we should appreciate. And I just I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess I'll add a little bit to that. Uh, so 
from a lost diary of Tree Frog 7, which I haven't read in ages, but <laughs> um, it was part of its inspiration was uh, it's set in the world of my first novel, Zara the Windseeker. And in Zara the Windseeker, we have a main character who she lives in this place. Um, it's, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah, the Green Jungle. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's set in a place that is like Nigeria, but technologically advanced. So, and the, the technology is biotechnology. So everything is through plants and, and nature. So she lives in this place, she lives in this, um, in this town that is right on the outskirts of the greeny jungle, which is the forbidden jungle where nobody goes in there. You're not supposed to go in there. You will die if you go in there. And, um, and eventually, the, the, ba the basic plot of Zara the Windseeker is she has to go in there. Duh, I'm not going to write that kind of jungle and not have her go in there. That's very obvious and predictable, which is fine. So, so yeah, and when she goes in, she has um, this thing that's very much like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if anyone's read that. It's, this, it's, a, it's a book that, it's an e-book that has all this in incomplete information about things in the greeny jungle. It's incomplete and some of, some of it is like not working, it's mis malfunctioning and all of that. So she goes in with that. And the, that e-book is written by the greeny jungle explorers. And so From a Lost Diary of Tree Frog 7 is written by, um, it's from the perspective of one of those explorers. And the, those explorers are all crazy. <laughs> they like half of them or most of them die and they know they're going to die and they don't care if they get these diseases and all of that because they're just so into the science and the exploration. So yeah, that, that story is from the perspective of, um, of, one of, those, of one of those characters. And that's really, that's really the inspiration of it. Um, in terms of Lovecraft, <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't go into that. Um, my only thing that I'll say about Lovecraft is put Nnedi Okorafor in Lovecraft in Google and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. Other questions? Yeah. Or, okay. To make sure it's working. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, I'm going to try, hopefully this makes sense, because I have I drove here from Houston and I'm at like 5 a.m., so I'm a little tired. <laughs> uh, I graduated from University of Houston, and one thing I've kind of noticed in the creative writing departments is it's becoming a lot more diverse, especially at the undergraduate field. But as I've done more research in the graduate field, it seems that it's a bit more limiting for writers of colors to find environments where we can work with other writers of color in these fields. So I guess my question would be, what would you recommend for writers of color or who are very much outside of the normal literary world going into a graduate program that feels very limited or then into, a, into the literary world, which seems even more limited given how there's a certain expectation of narratives? Yeah. Um, oh, I have so much to say on that. Okay, where do I even begin? Um, okay, so I have... I have a master's in journalism, a master's in literature, and then a PhD in literature with an emphasis in creative writing. Now, through, that's a lot of schooling. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, throughout that, and my bachelor's is, um, was in rhetoric, which is creative writing from uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. So um, in all of those years, I was probably either one of very few people of color or the only person of color in my classes. And then on top of that, in all of those years, all of my professors, and I learned so much from my professors, which I'll talk about in a second, but all of my professors were very anti-science fiction or fantasy. You would come into the workshop and the first thing they would say is no one is allowed to write science fiction or fantasy. You cannot do that. Um, and I think, Part of it may be because I come from an immigrant background and my parents came to this country knowing some of its issues of race, but their philosophy was always, you will excel no matter what. You will always find a way no matter what. No matter what is thrown at you, you, you navigate. So that was the philosophy that I grew up with and that's what I entered all of that with, that I would navigate. So for example, um, <laughs> In uh, my science fiction, in, in my, um, there was a novel writing workshop during my PhD where on the first day the professor came in and said the usual thing, no one is allowed to write science fiction or fantasy. And I knew I was writing this post-apocalyptic <laughs> novel set in Niger in the future where part of the, part of the, um, 
where nuclear bombs had des destroyed the world as well as a crazy Haitian mad scientist had created a peace bomb which exploded at the same, at the same time as the nuclear bombs and brought magic back to the world. So <laughs> des destruction and creation together. So I'm writing this thing, she comes in and says that and I'm just thinking, okay. I didn't think, oh, I'm gonna drop the class, no. I just thought, okay, hmm, what should, how am I gonna do this? And then I just said, oh yeah, what I'm writing is magical realism. <laughs> I kid you not. That's all, I, I said, this is magical realism, called it that, it was fine. <laughs> it was fine. So I was like, I think, and, but part of why it was fine was because it was well written. It was good, you know? So like, when something is really good, this, it's hard to argue with that. And a lot of time, what I discovered with the bias against um, um, speculative fiction as a whole in academia is it's been because a lot, of the, a lot of the professors who are against it or just feel like it's not real literature, they haven't read it. You know, they don't know it. So once they know it and once they learn it, they realize, okay, this is not, um, this is real literature. This is actually great. Because that, that, that um, professor who came in and said that eventually was my advisor for my PhD. So it's like there are ways to convince and talk to people. So there's that. As far as being a person of color in a, in a, a place where you are the only one or there are very few of you, you just barrel forth. You just hold your head up and, and, and make sure what you're what you're writing is good. That's what you should focus on. Don't focus on the fact that you are one of few. I mean, it's, of course you need to find community. For me, I always found community through, at each of my universities, I always found community through the Nigerian Students Associations. So I'd always find, you know, find people through that. But other than that, like, I didn't, I didn't specifically isolate myself. I also was the type of student who was open. I was always just open to hearing and listening to other people and um, kind of embracing um, different experiences. I think a lot of people need that, but <laughs> it's unfortunate. But um, I think that if you go in, hold your head up, and sometimes understand that you may have to kind of guide people and educate people along the way and understand that and be, be as open to it as you can, that's, I think that's the way, that's the way to go about it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, things have to start somewhere. So, for example, like with my parents being the first blacks to move into that neighborhood, someone had to do it, you know, and, and usually the pioneers go through a lot, it's difficult and it's, it's, um, it feels, I, you feel isolated and you feel uh, lonely, but you kind of, you barrel forth and you find a way, if that makes sense. Cool. <laughs> I think Alex has a question, and then, yeah. One of the many things, oh, sorry. One of the many things I loved about Binti was um, your use of the word people to describe all sorts of unique races. Uh, many, most science fiction authors don't do that. Um, and I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah. Um, I just see all living things as people. That's like, I will see ants, they're people to me. I will see pigeons doing their thing, they're people to me. Crazy people, but they're, they're, they are people. Um, I think it's, it's a general, that's a general philosophy of mine. And it, it's kind of moved its way um, to the forefront, especially in Binti, where uh, I got to really explore that and, and flesh that out and show that. that was, that's really important to me. Um, this idea of human-centered, even human-centered intelligence is something I've, I've questioned. I remember reading something about um, octopus, octopuses, octopi, which one is it? Octopi, yeah. Reading something about octopi and how extraordinary they are and whether they're intelligent or not. And, um, and I think it was like, it was like this, this news article that said um, if, if, if an octopus created uh, research to define intelligence, one of the first things they would ask is how many, you know, how many colors can you change your, your, your flesh if it's cut off? You know, because octopuses, octopi can do that. So it's like, you know, the, these definitions of intelligence have always been, um, have always been of interest to me. What makes something superior or inferior? Issues of uh, hierarchy, um, I'm very, anti-hierarchy, because I think everything needs everything and, and everything kind of um, 
um, feeds off of everything and everything is connected. So I think that's where my idea of people comes from. And you kind of saw that in the comic as well. Uh, I got to, that was one of the first times I got to explore this idea of, of many kinds of people um, being, it being in an airport. And then just one last thing on that. In Binti, in Binti 2, there is an airport scene that I had like a, like a, what was it, a, a moral, just a problem <laughs> where I got stuck because I, I started thinking about what would an intergalactic airport be like? And I felt like I went mad for a little bit because, you know, I, I started thinking, I'm like, okay, if this intergalactic airport is for all kinds of people with a capital P, um, where, would there be places where a human being cannot go, you can't, where, where the atmosphere would need to be different, and where the, the size, and started thinking about size, I started thinking about all kinds of things, because of the, the idea of diversity, and the diversity of life, and diversity of intelligence, it was just, oh, I had to, I got stuck for a little bit, just imagining that, so, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, was there a hand over here? Yes. Hi. Hello. This kind of uh, piggybacks off of the uh, previous question. Uh, you were speaking from the perspective of a student, and now this question um, asks you to speak from a perspective of a professor, Dr. Orkor. Uh, I am. Um, I'm a big advocate of uh, science fiction and fantasy, and I'm continuously trying to turn people on to the merits of the genre who read literature and think less of genre. I was curious um, if you get people in your classes coming up to you and saying, oh, this is great stuff. I wish I read it before. If you have a, an anecdote of that. And uh, secondly, any works of the genre do you draw from in class that are your favorite works from uh, science fiction fantasy? Yeah. Um, I've had several. Like, when I, when I teach science fiction and fantasy, I prefer to... Um, I don't teach the classics. And that's one of the things that I tell my students. I, I tell them, I'm like, you're not gonna get what you expect in this class. You're not, you're not gonna get the usual at all. Um, because one, science fiction is very broad, very broad. And it's, it's actually, when you, when you look at it properly, which is hard to do because most of the, the books on science fiction, to me, are not, don't, don't approach it in, in a global way, because that's what I want to see. And if there are any students out here who are thinking about, who have any ideas for research, I would love to see like a global, a research on science fiction as a global, um, a global genre, not something that, that is rooted first, only, first in the West and everything is connected to that. Because there are several, par several parts of the world, every part of the world um, imagines the future, every part of the world. And every part of the world has stories, and that have you know that exist present day. So, so that's how with my classes, that's the first thing I always say. You're not going to get the usual, the classics, um, because a lot of the classics I don't like. First of all, so <laughs> so there's that. Um, and so then my science fiction class, especially my science, I teach science fiction. That's the main one that that I've been teaching for the last few years. And in my science fiction classes, I tend to take a sampling. You know, it's almost a random sampling because there's just so much. Um, and and I, like to, I like to focus on the recent stuff because most people are familiar in some way with the older stuff. So I like to focus on the more recent stuff. Um, authors that, I've, that I like teaching, um, let's see, Ursula Le Guin, of course. Um, her short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omalas, is wonderful it's, it's just um especially for now it's a great that, that it, it's a short story first of all and it's easy to find and um it's a great conversation starter like that is in my science fiction classes that's the one i always start with because one like i said it's easy to find and no one can say oh i haven't gotten my books yet so there's that <laughs> but it's it's also a really it, it's short so everyone can read it and um it's it's 
it's written in such a way that just hits you hard. It hits you hard, and when it hits you hard, students will come to class ready to say something about it. So it's a great conversation starter, even for students who are quiet and who don't normally speak. You, you can't read that book or that short story without having something to say. So there's that. And then, let's see, Octavia Butler, of course. Octavia Butler I like because, not, not just because she's one of my favorite authors, but um, she's very readable. And for those students who are not that familiar with science fiction or aren't really into it, she's a perfect gateway. <laughs> she's a perfect gateway because her work is very accessible. Um, and it, it, she writes in a very sparse, clean way that, um, just a lot that kind of draws students in. So I usually have Octavia Butler near the beginning of the class too. And then um, Kim Stanley Robinson, whom I really like. And I, I will be here next month. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Tell him I said hi. I haven't met him yet. <laughs> yeah, he's coming in May, actually. Oh my yeah. gosh. He's so cool. Best. Yes, yeah. he is. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Don't miss that. <laughs> Don't miss that. And it's like, a, he writes like he writes hard, well-researched science fiction. And um, I usually put him near the end because his work can be very dense. But like, he's one of those science fiction writers who has perfected the art of the info dump. He does it well. <laughs> he does it well. He does it in a way where you want to, you just want to settle into his world. It's like, you can see, you can literally, um, you can literally touch things like when you read him. So he's he's one of my he's one of my favorites too. And he's recent though for me. I've just recently started reading, uh, getting into him and adding that to my syllabus. Yeah, I could keep going, but I will stop. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, here, I'm Pia. I'm going to give this to you. And and you know what, Margo, you can ask a question too. Just don't don't talk too close to it. Real loud. I'll. I'll that's okay, wow. So um, my question is in several parts and you'll just pick up whatever you get out of it that makes sense. Uh, do you consider yourself an American or a Nigerian okay. author? Okay. Do you, how do you situate your work in, in sort of a tradition. I, I know nothing about Nigerian mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know how, how at home you feel with it. Mm -hmm. And also, do you have a, a Nigerian readership and do they read your books differently? Okay, yeah, great questions. Okay, um, it, uh, it's all, I hate autocorrect. It just messes everything up. Okay, so do I consider myself an American or a, uh, Nigerian. I'm both. I have two passports. <laughs> um, I'm both and I'm neither. You know, um, like I said, I'm, I'm Niger. I, that's why I use the word Niger American because it's one word and um, it, that means it brings it brings both sides together into one word that cannot where neither can be separated. That's that's very important to me because the way that I've grown up, um, where my parents could have just been immigrants who didn't go back. You know, my parents from a young age started bringing my siblings and I back to Nigeria. And because of that, I had this dual kind of experience. And, and it's a, also dual confusion as well, because a lot of times both of the, the culture, American culture and Nigerian culture, it's particularly Igbo, both of my parents are Igbo, um, conflict, greatly conflict. And I've had to like fight that. And then there's the issue of language, and that's like a whole other discussion. So I consider myself both you know, evenly, and like neither, neither of the two can be separated. Um, where does my work lie in terms of Nigerian um, literature? I, I'd like to call, I, I, for example, Who Fears Death in particular, and Binti, the Binti series, actually everything I've written, um, <laughs> I, I would consider them African literature, very much so. Um, I, part of my, for just a small part of it, a large part of my PhD, was studying African literature. That was, and it wasn't just because um, I just like had to put it on there. It was because that's what I was most obsessed with, even coming into the into the PhD. When I was supposed to be doing my, um, when I was doing my uh, master's in journalism, 
I remember going into, this was at Michigan State, going into the library, and they have a wonderful library, and I would just go in there sometimes just to go find books, journalism books, and I was walking through an area, and that was where I found the African, a whole wall full of African literature, like all of the African literature in the library, and I started spending a lot of time there. I started taking out, like, I basically read everything on that wall when I was supposed to be <laughs> doing something else. So um, I read all these authors, and like, and so that got into me. And then when, as I was reading, especially Nigerian women writers, I would see the stories of my own, um, like my mother, my grandmother, and, and cousins, all of that. I was connecting it to my own heritage so I could see that, I could see that. And so when I started writing my own stories, a lot of just what I wanted to write, one of the reasons I wanted to write, for example, um, Zara the Windseeker, it's a it's, you know, science fiction fantasy um, narrative with this female character. One of the reasons why I, I wrote Zara the Windseeker was because I would see my cousins, my female cousins in Nigeria whenever we would visit versus my male cousins. My male cousins would be allowed to play video games and do whatever. And then my female cousins always had chores. They're like the same age, but the girls always had chores to do. They had to wash the dishes. They had to do the laundry, always had something that they were doing. And I'm like, God, can they just chill? Are they allowed to chill? And um, so when that was when the story about um, this girl who could fly popped into my head. I wanted to write something that these girls in particular would be so engrossed in that they would drop their chores and go hide somewhere to read. <laughs> So there, so there was that, and then Who Fears Death was a lot of the, just drawn from a lot of the stories that I would hear, um, especially women in my family talk about when they didn't think I was listening. So it's like there, there's a, a very strong connection to um, African literature because a, a, lot of, a lot of the um, African female writers would write stories like that. And, um, and there was like a stigma I remember reading somewhere that they, they would call it kitchen literature which you can hear the kind of, you know, you can hear the condescending um, hint in there. And so, yeah, that, so, th so that's the linkage with that. Um, readership, oh yeah. Okay, and then I have several of my books are published in Nigeria. And, um, and it's been an interesting experience because a lot of my, the, the cool thing is a lot of what I write is very deeply rooted in um, especially Nigerian culture and uh, mythology and folklore and juju. <laughs> and um, when Nigerians read my work, they catch everything that I'm doing. They know all the obnoxious things that I am doing. They know like all of the all of the the magical things that I'm using and and dealing with and that are woven into the plot. They catch it all. And um, and in, in some ways, because they catch it all, it, it has sparked a lot of discussion, we'll just put it that way. So, so yes, um, I have several of my books published there. We actually have to start the, the book signing, but let us thank Nadia Korafor one more time.